We are super excited to share this video with you guys. Mercedes and I have been looking for RV friendly land all over America. And in this video, we're gonna share 10 things that you have to look for if you're looking for RV friendly land. Because it's not as easy as you would think. It's tough. Welcome back to the RV Odd Couple. My name is John. And my name's Mercedes, and we are V in pursuit of freedom, independence, and adventure. Because life is so short. Guys, we are so excited to bring this video to you this week. We've done a ton of research on purchasing RV land. With the circumstances that have happened in the past year for the Panorama and state and national campgrounds closing down, as full time RVers, we need a safe place to go. A home base of sorts. A home base. So Mercedes and I started looking at small pieces of land all over the country. And within our research, we found out fascinating information. In this video, we're going to share 10 things that we learned about buying RV land. And this is huge, guys, because you would assume that just buying a piece of property and owning said property would mean you can do what you want on that property. Yeah, right? This, no. this is America, right? The truth is, is that there's so many different rules and zoning and health departments. There's actually a spectrum when you start considering buying an RV lot. So what we mean by a spectrum as far as RV friendly land, it's kind of a continuum. And on one side of the continuum, you have the stuff that's already set up. So these types of properties will have all the utilities. They'll be deeded. They'll be designed for RVs specifically. On the other side of the spectrum, this is where you kind of enter the wild, wild west. Yeah, which we love. Yeah, so maybe you're going into land that has not been cleared yet. It may not be drivable for an RV. Maybe it's in the middle of nowhere and you can't even get cell reception. So there's kind of this spectrum. And in that spectrum, you need to find how much work do you really want to do to make sure you can park your RV there. We started looking for land in communities and uh, incorporated counties. Now we're starting to look for larger pieces of land outside that are unincorporated, right? And, and we find that this is the most conducive to the type of RV land that we want to own. We've been looking at big pieces of land that we could possibly share with other like-minded families, right? And actually, we're looking at all the rules and the things that need to be done to be able to do this so that everybody's interests are protected. So you buy a piece of land outside of an incorporated area. Some of them in Texas don't even have building departments. Can you imagine buying a piece of land and doing whatever you want to do with it? Well, guess what? It's not as easy as you guys think. It's really fun looking for property, but you have to find a piece of property that you're going to be able to do or accomplish the goal. In our case, we want to put an RV there or buy a big piece of land, split those lots up so it's multiple titles into a private community. So the easiest way to accomplish this is grab the legal description on the property and make some phone calls. If they have a local building department, a local health department, um, if they have a zoning department, right? And they'll be able to tell you what you can and cannot do with property. Get a good realtor. The realtor yeah. should know. It's their job to know and do the research to find out if you can do what you want to do to purchase that land. Obviously, they don't want to waste their time and we don't want to waste our time. But if the realtor can't answer those questions, grab the property description, call the local building department if there is one, the zoning department, the health department. And there's a few questions that you can ask that we're gonna go over right now. Which this actually leads to the second thing that you wanna look for. You see, is there an HOA? You see, you don't have to just look at the state requirements, the county requirements, the city requirements that property could also have an HOA on top of that. <laughs> and if it does, I mean- Just it, forget it, unless it's for RVs. Exactly, and if it's an HOA property that's designed for RVs, then you need to look into like, what value does the HOA offer? What did the fees actually include? Is it a thriving community? Or are they like on their last dollar and you know those dues are gonna go up? So the HOA isn't necessarily a deal killer, but Unless it's a designated RV spot, it could be a big problem. Now, the third thing that you need to look for is accessibility. And there's kind of a spectrum to that too. And here's what we mean. You see, there are some properties that are gonna be 45 minutes to an hour away from groceries, or maybe they're so far away that there will be zero internet signal 
or, or phone signal whatsoever. Or security, right? That's Out in the middle of one. nowhere, no police activity. Mm -hmm. and, and, and maybe it's not even accessible by a, a standard vehicle. Maybe there's no way you could even get the RV on it because there's no roads in that area yet. <laughs> Whereas then on the other side of the spectrum, everything is nice, flat and paved. You've got internet, you got a grocery store, you know, a half mile away. So there's going to be this spectrum of accessibility to those, those key things that everyone needs, those key functions, groceries, police, fire department, right. you know, internet, cell phone tower is a big right. one, guys. So that's something you're going to have to ask yourself those hard questions like how much accessibility do I need and how much time and money am I willing to spend? To, to, you know, grade roads on your property. All right, baby, you ready? Good thing we have a Jeep, huh? I know. Here we go. Let's see. Yeah, you see both on say Jeep? Let's see if we can get out here and see. This is actually really nice compared to some of the places we've been to. Uh -huh. Oh my God, could you imagine trying to drive the RV down this? Now the perfect piece of land that Mercedes and I are looking for is going to be something that is zoned recreational or agricultural. Those seem to be a little bit easier, but again, there's no one way. You gotta, yeah. It's going to vary depending on which state, county, municipality, all that stuff. It's mm -hmm. going to make a big difference. But we're looking for a little bit of seclusion that's probably a 30 to 45 minutes away from like the closest Walmart or services, right, gas stations. And we're looking for a place that's going to be very quiet, very peaceful, right? We'd like some tree cover on it. But that does come at a cost because when you're out in the middle of nowhere like that, you're going to not have security. You're not going to have access to services like electricity sometimes. As far as easements go, you have to get access to the property. We found some really cool property, got excited, and then when you dug into it, there was no right of way. There was no easement to actually get to the property, and that's why they were so inexpensive. So you're going to want to be able to access the property legally from a road that hopefully is county maintained or state maintained. And this is where I think you really need to be honest with yourself. You see, John having his experience as a builder is going to know certain things that if it was just me, I, I mean, I've never heard of the word easements before. I mean, I've heard of easel and you know, you write on it, but definitely not easements, right? So you need to be honest with yourself about what you can do, what you're not really good at, and, and what you should just, you know, leave to the profession. Hire it out. Yeah. So now that you've found your dream piece of land, right, you know that you can do what it is you want to do with that piece of land. The next thing you're going to want to do is find out if, the, if you can get an address for that property. Very, very important, right? Typically, that's never a problem, but most counties will make you put in an approved driveway. You're going to have to pull a permit to put a driveway into that property, and then they will give you an address for that property. Once you've got an address, how are you going to get water, right? Mm -hmm. And some counties will have county water that you just tap into, but there's a big fee for that. When I was building in Colorado, those tap fees were about $14,000 just to tap into the city's water system, guys. And so it can be super, super expensive. Now, in Mercedes and I's case, we want to be completely self-sufficient and dependent. We're hoping to buy a piece of property that we can put a well in. So does it have water rights, right? If it does have water rights, the best thing to do is to call some local drilling companies and ask them, hey, give them the legal description. They'll know where it is, right? They've probably, hopefully, been doing this for years. They'll be able to give you an idea, but not a guarantee of the cost of drilling. So oh, yeah. You could <laughs> drill 150 feet and hit good, clean water. Sometimes, if you're in the mountains, you may have to drill to 3,000 feet oh, to hit water. So it's very important that you call the local drilling company, ask them what they think it might take hit water on that property because they'll know the area so they should have a sense but they can't guarantee yes so along the lines of water whether you have water rights whether you need to tap into the water for the city or the county or whatnot um there's also electricity and <laughs> that's a is, big one well yeah because like tesla's electricity in the air didn't quite work out <laughs> so so what do you do about electricity Electricity is pretty important, guys, but it, in today's world, it's not absolutely necessary, right? 
And so look to where the closest electrical lines are to the property. Call the electric company, ask them if they service that area. You may want to, you can actually invite them out. They'll walk it off. They'll tell you how much it will cost to get electricity to the property. The more secluded it is, the farther sometimes the electricity is going to be. Electrical companies will charge you per the foot and per pole, unless it's underground, to install electricity. This can be an absolutely huge cost. But because today we have solar, it's not necessary that you have to have electricity. It's nice if you can get electricity, but you don't necessarily have to have electricity in today's world. And I suspect that that's going to change quicker and quicker, that solar and batteries are going to become more of the norm in the future. So now you've got your dream piece of property. You know that you can do what you want with it and they're not going to stop you. You found out that you can get an address. You found out that you are going to drill a well and that you can get electricity. And if you can't get electricity, you're going to go with some type of a generator or a solar system to do this. The next thing you're going to want to do is take care of your poop, guys. And what this means is, is that you want to find out if you can put a septic system in that area. Mm. Best way to do this is to call the local county health department, right? Now, the county health department is going to tell you what you need to do for them to approve a septic system. There are counties in Texas, they don't care. There's counties in Florida, they don't care. You can go ahead and put any type of septic system in that you want to, but most counties are gonna force you to pull a permit to put in a licensed septic system or an engineered septic system. Once you know you need to do that, you need to call an engineer. They come out and do a core drilling report. The engineer, after taking those core soils tests, will design a system that will perk that lot depending on how many people you're gonna be servicing. So if it's one campsite, two campsites, 10 campsites, 12 campsites. That makes a lot of sense because in Florida, you can't be too close to the coast yeah. with your septic system. Right. And, and not just that, but also like soil, septic, like for us, our goal is to be self-sustaining, looking at those USDA hardiness zones, yeah. because that'll tell you like Great your climate point. and what plants specifically will will do better in certain hardiness zones than others. Right. So yeah, I could see how that would be a huge one. So the next thing you want to consider is natural disasters that happen in the area that you want to own this land, right? Uh, is it on the West Coast? And good luck doing anything on the West Coast, well, even yeah. the Upper Northeast, right? You're going to be dealing with earthquakes. You're going to be dealing with oh, hurricanes yeah. in Florida. You're going to be dealing with tornadoes in Tornado Alley. Yep. These are all things that you're really going to want to consider if you're going to be doing something with an RV, right? And so in Florida, maybe you're going to have to put some straps down with mm. what's called helicals into the ground to strap that unit down. This is something that they do with mobile homes in Florida. There's actually a way to anchor those rigs down so that they're not going to fly away on you. Another thing to consider, is it in a flood zone? You never want to put anything in a flood zone. So you got to be super, super careful to do a little bit of flood research. Well, and if it is in a flood zone, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can't do anything in that area, but you will be incurring extra costs. Like you'll have additional flood insurance depending on the structure and and extra things that you're gonna to wanna to look at. And you're also gonna to wanna to make sure the property grades in such a way that you're not sitting in a basin. <laughs> you're not getting washed out, <laughs> yeah. right. The next piece that is really important, you see, we want some privacy. We want some trees. We want that space to kind of be on our own. We don't want to be in the middle of a hustling and bustling city, right? <laughs> but there's a cost to everything that you want. There's a pro and a con, right? And the con is that if you're in the middle of nowhere, if, if a bad guy finds you, the good guys are really far away. <laughs> Some of the things you should really consider if you are secluded out away from fire department, police department, is your personal protection of your family and your property, guys. So it's just really, really important that if you're going to be secluded, make sure that you can defend what's yours and what you love. Your job is to take these 10 considerations that we've listed and to really make a list in each one. What is it that you're looking for? What are you looking to do on the property? What is your budget realistically? Remember buying the property isn't necessarily the most expensive purchase. Uh -huh. Sometimes doing the stuff to the property will cost five times as much as the actual land itself. Yeah, it's a great point because you might need some chainsaws. You might oh, yeah. need a little skid steer to do the, a lot of the work yourself, right? Rather than hiring this stuff out. 
Mercedes and I have already eyeballed a few properties that we yeah. love. One of them is 180 acres. We've also had our Beyond Squad members reach out to us and say they're interested in maybe jumping in on that community aspect of it. What's really cool about that is you can actually deed pieces up. We haven't gotten to the details yet. Yeah. Once we get the group together and we actually have property that we can look at, we'll you know we'll present it to that group of people. But we are super excited about this. We have a lot of hope for our future and building the community that we want to live in. Yeah, because we're all thinking it, right? We all need a bug out place, right? Yeah. Things are getting a little crazy. Things are and, crazy. And, and, and okay, maybe not bug out. Maybe it can just be like a, an escape, right? A right. nice place outdoors that you can really enjoy nature. Whatever your rationale is, we can definitely all relate to wanting to have a place that's beautiful, that's out in nature, and, and that's safe, right? So if you're interested please make sure that you are signed up for our newsletter because this is something that we're going to relay to our newsletter people first make sure you sign up for the newsletter and we'll see you in the next video